Anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Karim Adi Presito, uh, who's from the Hebrew University and from University of Copenhagen. Uh, Karim was supposed to visit us last year in the spring, um, but unfortunately it didn't happen. And rather than waiting for the visit, we decided to uh, ask Karim to uh, give the first colloquium of the season. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to ask Karim. And I look forward to when he comes and visits Chicago at some point in the murky future. <laughs> Let's not make any definite uh, <laughs> predictions on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, let's assume that you will come, but we just can't be sure about exactly when. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, well, thanks very much for having me. So the idea is you should, for the most of the time, see the slides. And then uh, occasionally I will go to the blackboard so you can somehow, you can choose yourself what windows maximum, right? So that's just for, for I, I will indicate when I go to the blackboard, okay? So that's, that makes it easy. So let me see that this works. All right, so, um, okay, I want to outline um, some, some, some basic combinatorial problems in their relation to Hodge theory and somehow something that is kind of goes beyond classical Hodge theory in the sense that we want to work with somehow theorems that we classically associate with projective varieties, but that don't exist, that, that somehow that don't really work, or they're not uh, somehow proven, or that somehow they're not known on, on, on non-projective varieties. So, um, and then we start slowly, and somehow with a really uh, um, basic Freud problem that goes back a long time, that this is um, to, to draw graphs in the plane. So, what I'm interested in is a Fourier basic problem, you have a beta graph, so a graph that you can draw in the plane without, without cheating, all right? So without drawing double edges or without drawing loops or vertices. And then you can ask, well, how many, how many of these edges can we have in terms of the number of vertices, all right? So you can try a little and work with some basic examples, and you'll see that, well, it seems that somehow you cannot have more, if you're greedy about it, you cannot have more than three times the number of vertices in terms of the number of edges. All right, and that's all that you can have. Um, and that, in fact, is a theorem. It's not hard to prove, and it really goes back a long time, um, essentially to, to the cut and Euler, and um, the bound is really this. Okay, this this what you get somehow by 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 being greedy about it is is correct. So the, the number of edges is at most three times the number of edges. All right. So um, now the next question is: I mean, one thing that you can basically ask in any talk, and so it's really the first question or the second question. Well, what about higher dimension? Um, and I don't know whether when if this came up when I don't even know whether the cut and other gave, gave talks at any point, but uh, but uh, somehow it's certainly natural somehow nowadays to, to ask this question. Um, and so let's let's formulate this. So um, it's a problem due to Gleibaum, and then it was kind of um, formulated again by by Gil Kalai, um, with my colleague in uh, Jerusalem and Kambia Sakaria. Um, and this is, let's say, okay, so graphs in higher dimension. Okay, you can always have better graph in dimension three and higher. So that's kind of um, not so interesting. Well, what's, so the next natural thing is to look at a simplicial complex, right? So I have a simplicial complex and um, I'm asking, well, um, can I embed this into, um, well, okay, so now the question is what, 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 what dimension do you want to embed it? So let's say you have um, a K dimensional complex. Sorry, was it something? Or? Okay, sorry. Um, uh, so you can ask the question well, okay, so you have a K dimensional superficial complex. Which dimension is interesting to map it to? And well, it turns out that somehow the, 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 the most interesting dimension is kind of this threshold dimension. And somehow 
So now you want the, 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 the k-dimensional faces to intersect in general position. So you want a k-dimensional complex into your field and two cases. And you see that Euclid really has made it to the mouth. I mean, field level is one thing, but once your name is written in lower lowercase, that's kind of, I don't think it gets better. Um, and so what, what, what's kind of, what, what can you conjecture? Well, you can, we can, you can try and make it greedy again, right? So you, you, you draw, you start somewhere with the tetrahedron that you put into R4, and then you, you add another vertex and draw as many triangles as you can. And you can ask, well, how many k-dimensional faces can you have? And now, naturally, what you can come to is that, again, it seems to be linear. And this is the answer I'm going to present today with a caveat. So I'm saying that some of the, the, the number of k faces of delta um, is at most k plus two times the number of k minus one faces of delta, provided the bedding is sufficiently nice. Um, which in particular for dimension four, so k equals two, um, is not something that is given. Um, and of course, okay, so this leaves open the means of we will let's see later how this is proven. Uh, it leaves open, of course, the case of topological embeddings. And it's also really, so it relies on this assumption that uh, the complex is simplicial. So you can, of course, ask, well, what happens for, um, what happens for strongly regular cell complexes, right? For strongly regular CW complexes, you will conjecture the same bound, and in fact, the original conjecture of good bound Somehow, I mean, it's positive the same bound, but somehow, I mean, the method does not work. And if I have time by the end, it somehow might, I might explain why the method does not work. Um, all right. So, how do I, how do I check this? How do I, how do I solve this? Um, well, I start, let me start with the polytope. And somehow, those of you somehow who, who, who took at some point some, some toric varieties or some algebraic geometry course, they know that, okay, so if I have uh, a polytope with, uh, with boundary the sufficient complex, then I can um, associate to it a sufficiently nice variety. And I can describe that somehow, even without really going into the variety, I can look at the cohomology ring of the object that I get, and it's sufficiently nice to describe. So one way to do this is, so if I have my polytope, then what I can do, is I can take the fan over that polytope. All right. And I, I basically look at the space of, of piecewise polynomial uh, continuous functions on this on this fan. So on every of every single one of these domains, I want to be polynomial, but I want to the, the transition pieces, I want to be continuous, and that's some other space. And if you mod out out of this space, additionally, some other the ideal generated by the global linear functions, then you get the cohomology ring. And that's a nice object to work with. You don't even have to, help to talk about the variety. So that's nice enough. Um, all right. So this variety is nice. That's kind of a, a useful observation for us. So if I have a deep on top, then what I get is a concrete one of the algebra. All right, and um, so this concrete, so I, I mean, just to remind you, concrete on does what just means for me. I have a, I have a perfect pairing, so the d graded piece is just isomorphic to R. Okay, so there's a natural degree map here. And then I have a natural, I have a pairing between the degree I part, so right, the degree D minus I, right? So now, again, right back to my picture of the polynomials, this is somehow I'm naturally graded, so I'm stratified around degree. And I get this, I get this perfect pairing, and that's all good enough. Now, algebraic geometry actually tells us a little more. It tells us that there is something even nicer and something even more, um, even more beautiful about the um, about the uh, about the geometry of 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 of, of these of these cohomology rings. And this is, for instance, and in particular for me, important the hard lecture theorem. So how much that theorem basically says that, okay, so this, this isomorphism between degree R, degree, between degree I and degree D minus I, this is realized in a nice enough way. Okay, it is realized as an isomorphism with respect to the multiplication factor of the ring. All right, that's a problem, right? This is not something not, uh, it's more, 
no ordinary manifold will, will enjoy because it in particular implies that the betting numbers are unilateral, right? They, they, they rise and then they fall again, but they cannot look like a, I mean, which one is the one with a, with two, uh, which one is the animal with two? I think the dromida is the one with two, no? Or the camel? It cannot be a camel. Let's say it cannot be a camel. Um, and it usually is about this, this left shed theory which comes with, uh, with, uh, with a twin that, uh, that usually is proved together. I mean, there are exceptions, but somehow, of course, it's, will be, it will be important to, to, to know this, this cousin um, of the left shed. And this it says that basically, okay, so once I have this, this left shed isomorphism, I can define the bilinear form, right? This Q here. And what it, what I'm saying is that for polytops, well, the the signature of this uh, um, of, of of this bilinear form is 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 kind of determined in terms of is is kind of determined on a natural subspace. Well, this is a subspace of primitive uh, primitive elements. This P is primitive, okay? Primitive under this multiplication with L. Um, and I notice here there's a small. I, I, I sorry, there's this omega that you see here, if you see my mouse cursor, should be an L. So this here should be an L. I didn't catch that when I tried to uniformize the slide. Um, all right. Now that's an important theorem, um, but I needed, I mean, I needed a little more generality. Um, and here's the observation. So if I look at any general superficial homology sphere, um, I can still define this ring, even though there's no variety. I can still define the intersection ring. I can mod out by, by something that behaves like the global linear functions, and I obtain a Poincare duality algebra. That's a theorem that is likely due to Hofstra, but it's one of his theorems that, um, um, that is, as far as I not know, not written down by him, but it appears in books that are too good for. Um, and now the question is, what, what about the hard left theorem, right? Um, is it still true, right? In, 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 can, I, can I still say something about uh, um, the, the, the hard left theorem in any, in, any, in, any, in any way, in any form? Um, and it's known that somehow basically this, this, kind of, this kind of nice Hodgman relations that I had on the last slide they cannot hold. Okay, so you can make a numerical argument that most spheres will not enjoy anything close to the Hodgman relation, for instance, using the Milner Tom type bound. Um, so, okay, so there are two questions. First of all, can I prove this? And second of all, I mean, I mean, first, maybe the first relevant question is why, why do I care? Well, I mean, the hard left shift theorem, it's known to have. Uh, um, a lot of implications in number theory is kind of one of the original motivations. Um, but I want to argue that it also has um, strong implications towards these kind of combinatorial or more geometric combinatorial questions. So I put up this kind of historical slide of a letter so that you can actually switch to the blackboard and make the blackboard large while you, so well, while the, the slides go into the background. Um, so why do I care? So let me go back to this, to this Grimbaum question. So, um, so Delta for me, this was something that I wanted to PL embed into R2D, right? So R2K, I think I use K. Okay. Um, instead of doing the PL embedding here, let me instead map it to S to K. Um, and then instead of really looking at this just as an embedding, let me just think of delta as a subcomplex of a triangulation sigma of S to K. All right? And now I have this object, A of sigma. Okay. And as a sub-object in this object, I have 
a of dalton so that's a quotient of my ring so let's see okay so let me not indicate the gradient for the moment it will be important in a second and this okay so a of delta is just uh, some other the, the the quotient by all those uh, somehow, by all those of, of a of sigma by all those monomials not supported in delta okay so that's a well-defined object so now let me write down two easy inequalities so if you remember so i, I generated this this ring one way to think about it, I, I thought about this as the ring of Cohen's polynomial functions. And if you think about it, the Cohen's polynomial functions of degree d, they're generated by the products of the Cohen's polynomial functions of degree one supported in given phases of cardinality d. What do I mean by that? So if you have, let's look at first at, at the functions of degree one. So the functions of degree one, I claim, are generated by the characteristic functions of rate, okay, or, or, or vertices. So these are the, those covariant polynomial functions that are zero on every vertex, except on one vertex. Okay, there's one vertex where uh, where many are zero on all others. It's clear that this generates for degree one. And now you can think about it a little, and you see that from out there. The covariant polynomial functions of degree k, they will be generated by the product of these over the cardinality k sets. And then you can work a little and see that, well, if I take out the global polynomials, then really I'm left only with the uh, function, the, those subsets that, that come from, from basis. Okay? And so I get my first inequality that is kind of important for me. So, I, so this year, um, this, this, Okay, what, what, what is the first inequality that I want? Well, I, I'm generated by phases. So the dimension of the case graded piece is larger equal to the, um, sorry, that's not the right one I want. So it's, it's smaller equal to the number of k minus one of phases. Of okay. Now, I already started to write the other inequality. So now I, I mean, I, I, I estimated the size of the space by looking at the number of generators. Um, and the other way that you can do it is well, I look at the number, of, I look at all the generators, and then I overestimate a, a relating set. And this gives me the inequality that the dimension of AK plus one of delta is larger equal. So I now write again the number of the generators. So the, K phases, delta, and now I have to estimate the number of relations. And you can work this out. This is um, exactly D plus one, or oh, sorry, K plus one um, times the number of K minus one phases. So for every K minus one phase, I get uh, K, plus, I get K plus one uh, relations, and now put them all together, I get these two estimates. And so, this kind of this kind of grid arm inequality, which was already rather beautiful and already rather nice, I can make it even nicer because now the inequality that I have to prove is that a k of delta is larger equal to a k plus one of delta in dimension. All right. So. Why would this? Why would this be interesting? Why would this um, be relevant for us? Well, let's look at Poincaré duality. So Poincaré duality gives us that a k of sigma and a k minus a k plus one of sigma. Right. So the fundamental class of this two k sphere it lives in the two k plus one. So these two are isomorphic. Okay, so I know that these two are the same, and I want that k and k plus one of delta. Well, I want uh, how how would I how would I how would I encode that one space is larger? Well, I would like to construct a subjection here, right? But this is natural if I have already a subjection here in form of the left shaped element, right? So that would be the once I have the left shaped element. I get automatically this inequality. All right. Okay, so 
This tells us that if I have the left sheds, I get um, I get my 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 desired inequality. I get the blue moment. Right? Blue moment All right. Questions so far? Okay, I'll just go on unless somehow someone shouts. Um, so now I want to kind of I want to take you through a little journey to how how would I actually prove hard left shift theorems beyond this this kind of classical geometric case, right? And I want to first go to a case that is kind of absolute away from classical in a certain sense. And this is a case of matroids. All right, so matroids are objects that uh, make make an abstraction of, of, of the classical of, uh, concept of linear independence. Um, they're still, uh, just like some triangulations of here, they are, um, well, they, they are combinatorial objects. That we can define something that behaves like the intersection ring um, of, of, of a classical geometric object. So if they are, if, are, if, if I'm looking at an arrangement over the, over the complex numbers, then I get a variety and there is a combinatorial construction um, it goes back to, to the continuum of Chesi and somehow and written by explicitly by Feichner, by Feichner and Jusvinsky that emulates this, this, uh, this, this combinatorial construction. Okay, that's uh, somehow that works somehow that in, in, in many cases of in many sense of the word is the same somehow. It's, it's, a, it's a right core monitoring in the combinatorial. All right, and so you can you can define it in much the same way that you define the um, uh, intersection ring of a sphere. You basically you basically come up. You look at the the the, the at, at uh, the, the intersection ring on the ground set, right? On, on on all these on all the subset of elements of your of your matrix, and then you basically cut out those that interest you. Basically, those that form subspaces, and you come up with some way of encoding it. I mean, this I mean, of course, somehow you, you do this inspired by some uh, some um you you do this inspired by 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 some algebraic geometry i don't actually see anyone anymore no okay ah okay uh all right so yeah i was a little scared because sometimes the zoom just cuts out all right <laughs> um it's good if one is there all right um all right uh, so okay so I, I do this of course i mean it's not somehow you just come up with this you do this inspired by, by the algebraic geometry by writing down um this uh, this ring in, in, the, in the complex realizable case explicitly and then you get this object and the result is well this is the, the theorem that i proved is to me and there are cuts um and this is that indeed for these rings, like in the classical case, we have hard left and hard one. The reason is that there is a notion of convexity. Here. There is a there is a notion of of ampleness here. Okay, um, it's still more really strictly more general than than the the classical the classical algebraic geometric version because there's basically a statement that says that if it comes if this ring comes from a cohomology ring of a variety. Um, then you can actually then you see this this this, this configuration the abstract combinatorial configuration um, comes from a, from a from a real, realizable from a from a from a from something that can realizable over the complex numbers for instance and this you prove by by an appropriate duck theorem because well if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck then it is a duck um, and this is rather interesting. Um, and it follows, I mean, it's not the first time that one, somehow one proved things like this in a purely combinatorial setting. So there was, for instance, the, the, the work of Elias Williamson um, that, that looked at basically uh, conjectures about Castell Lucifer polynomials. And before that, even I, I didn't mention him, but somehow he should be mentioned at least in words, but somehow the, 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 um, the space of the page right now um, is, uh, is, for instance, kind of Kavu, who kind of did this uh, before in 2004 for combinatorial construction of intersection cohomology. So this is well, all of this is kind of it follows the same idea. It's it's an idea due to Peter McMullen. I usually small. I just say McMullen in the um, 
in the in the stocks, but somehow in, in, in departments, but somehow where somehow where there are more 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 dynamical systems people. Uh, I, I usually say the I have to say the first name as well. So um, so this is okay. So this is a classical idea. Well, I, let me um, let me give you. I mean, one motivation was that uh, that if you have this, then you can also prove combinatorial conjectures about nature. So one important conjecture was exactly this log concavity of the characteristic polynomial. I mean, that's a nice side effect at the end, but for me, it's usually some other. So the most interesting thing is um proving these things these uh, deep algebraic theorems in a combinatorial way and then you get this kind of neat side product um which you can do in much the same way that i i, I now derive um the Grünbaum from the hard um but i mean this is also i mean this this is also it's not something something rather deep and tricky but small i mean for me the the the, the left shift is usually the more more interesting part so let me go to that so what is the the, the, the program of the proof here um, well, it basically says that you do a gradual deformation of your of your of your variety of your matroid of your combinatorial object, and you show that the hard left shifts and Hodriman are preserved. And in fact, the way that you do it is basically by an induction process. You know hard left shift along the deformation, and but if you have hard left shifts along the deformation at every point. Then um, you only need to know hard Hadriemann for one of the for one of these entries. Why? Because well, if you know Hadriemann for one, and then you know hard metric all the time, then the signature can never the, the signature can never flip in an unexpected way. So that's kind of the, the proof scheme. All right. So you know hard left shifts, then you know that some of this formula is not the generate, and then you cannot have flipping, right? Just by intermediate value of theta. That's it. All right. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful. Proof. Uh, it's a beautiful argument. Um, and it's it's well, it's it's about it's, it's, uh, has been used again and again in this context. Um, ah, and you see now I, I, I wrote it again. Um, unfortunately, we don't have convexity. So just as I said, I, I mean, so I mean, it uses in some way the geometry of of matroids. It uses the fact that my every matroid is realizable as part of a polytope. In this case, it's a tetrahedron, and in the classical case of polytops, it uses just the fact that you're convex. But this we cannot use. I mean, most most spheres, especially let's say a homology sphere, you will not be able to realize this boundary of a polytope. All right, so there's no way. I mean, but even for PL spheres, right? Even a PL sphere, most PL spheres will not arise as boundaries of polytops. There's no chance. Okay, so let me state the, the theorem that I get. And then let me explain the, the proof. Um, so I'm restricting to to special PLs yet. Um, I'm allowing homology. And actually, so I could go a little bit more general, but uh, so it, it's enough. It's right, if, it, if if I work with my if it's a rational homology sphere, this is not a problem. Um, and there's also a version if it's not PL, but you know, just a combinatorial, you know, just a, the triangulation that is homeomorphic. To the sphere, and there's even a weaker theorem that it says, okay, even if it's not um, a homeomorphic, then and it's just a whole rational homology manifold, rational homology equivalent to the sphere, then there's a, a statement that is appropriate for that, it's slightly weaker. Um, but I, I mean, rational homology sphere that is also a rational homology manifold is kind of a mouthful, so let me restrict to the simplicity also. So the statement is all right, so I am looking at the um the the, the 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 sphere and now i'm kind of looking at the the, the modernized space of all the possible fans that realize this combinatorics okay so um small so in other words what i say is that i'm looking at this uh, this intersection ring i take the polynomial range right r of x where the var the variables correspond to the vertices I mod out this ideal I sigma, which corresponds to the monomials x to the alpha, whose support is not in my sphere, right? So this is my purely combinatorial object. This will be somehow before I before I um, uh, do an attenuate reduction. And now I look at the modular space of all attenuate reductions. Um, 
And I'm saying, okay, so if I take a generic element of that, and then take a generic element of degree one, um, then I get an epsilon theorem, okay? With respect to that section, with respect to that element, I get an epsilon. All right? Um, okay. And so now I don't have a chance of having the Hodgman relations in this case, but there's still a companion, there's still a cousin to this version of the left hat zero. And it comes somehow, it's, it's related to, 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 to recent works of Boyard and Christian Ziegler, which from, I mean, they, they, look at, uh, they look at functions where somehow, where somehow every, many sections have a certain algebraic property. And we will, by the very end, we will see a relation to that. Um, and here's a statement. So we, I, I call this the, 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 the whole Laman relation. And it says I, I take the same by the, the same algebra by linear form with respect to L. And now what I'm saying is that I'm looking at it and just restricting it to certain subspaces. So these subspaces are cut out by the combinatorics of my of my state. All right. So they are cut out by the combinatorics of my sphere. And I use I see there's again a typo. This P should be sigma. I'm sorry. So P is equal to sigma. Actually, I can write it here. So P should be sigma. Sorry. Um, and then I have this theorem. And this is a really non-geometric theorem. So even somehow in those cases where we prove some our action without actually having more Gman, there is still some geometric idea behind it, but this is not really something non-geometric. And it's it's really more combinatorics than than uh, than uh, than geometry. I will somehow now. I will I will tomorrow. I will try to indicate the proof. How does it work? Um, but first, let me make some remarks. So there are some nice nice corollaries of this. For instance, as I already explained, the Grimbaud's Kalaisakaria conjecture. You get some nice, but I mean, honestly, rather weak bounds on somehow the um, on the side of a triangulation that somehow in terms of the Betty number. So it says that basically the number of Number of vertices has to grow in terms of the Betty numbers of the manifold. It says something about the, the, the phase vectors, so the number of possible faces of simplicial spheres. Um, that's all good and nice. One thing that I should warn you though is that um, these four Laman relations, they they really somehow they they, they they are not it, you know, this is really a theorem. You know, the way that you establish the whole Laman relations is somewhat transversal to the classical geometry. So um, it's not true that uh, this proof, the, the, the argument works, or the whole Laman relations is all for any variety where we classically know the Hodgman relations. And one, one simple example is P1 plus P1. Okay. If I look at P1 plus P1, actually, let me maybe uh, let me go to this uh, to the back to this backward that you can fill the Why not use the full space? So if I look at P1 plus P1. All right, I have this is just the fan over over the cube, and I take um, any any of these kind of divisors, and it doesn't quite line up. So this here is my um, prime divisor, and I, I take the variable x one and the intersection associated to it. And now the point should be of the whole amount relations. Well, that this that somehow the uh, the, the that this the 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 the, the, the Hojima carry the the, the, by the somehow, which in this case is just the Poincaré carry restricted to this square the monomial ideal, right? It's clearly square the monomial should be non degenerate, but clear, but, but you can work out is that x one square in this case is equal to zero. So the statement is really then that you need to deform your Artinia reduction. So you keep the same you keep the same equivariant cohomology of the variety, but you deform everything else about it. So if I deform this, right, like, like in the Hirtzebos surface, um, so this is my, my new fan, right? And then I square x1, then x1 square is equal, is not equal to zero. And that's exactly the small this whole amount relation. Um, it's, um, exactly. I mean, this you can actually, I mean, the, the criterion here is exactly that 
these somehow these 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 you don't lie on a line. These two points adjacent to this uh, this uh, this 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 uh, variable, this this vertex, do not lie on the line. We will see later where where this comes. Okay. So um, let me okay. So let me now, after I talked about a little bit of the applications, let me indicate um, the idea of the proof. And this was the lemma. I mean, one of these things is now if you talk about it in a certain page in Paris, it is kind of crowded by many uh, Russians. Then this is one of these lemmas that somehow they for the first for the first minute they say it's, it's wrong, but then the next somehow the next thing it's well, it, but this is obvious. And it's really an obvious lemma. So, um, so this was a conversation I had uh, back back at this institute in uh, well, not quite Paris. Um, is that uh, well? Okay, so okay, it's trivial, but it, I mean it, this should be known to every child, and certainly Cornet can do it. Um, this is the following them, right? I, I want to have I, I look at two linear maps over any infinite field or any field that is large enough, actually. Um, and I want to I want to construct a map that is as regular as possible from it, right? I want the kernel of a generic linear combination of these two to be um, well. I want it to be I want it to be the, the intersection of the two kernels. I cannot do that, right? And here's the criterion, right? It's kind of the the first order approximation. If I apply B to the kernel of A, intersected with the image of A. Then it is zero, right? If this is true, then yeah, this uh, so nice intersection of the kernels. Oh, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Is this hypothesis symmetric in A and B? Um, the hypothesis is not. No, it's not symmetric. No. It's. Uh, I mean, what to elect? I mean, if you if you think about it somehow, algebraically, what I'm looking at is somehow the, the volume form of on, on A plus T B where T and look at T four. That's kind of what I'm looking at. Right? I mean uh, over the I mean if you do this over general field sets, then basically it's um, something called the representation theory of the conic equation. Okay. And now how do I how do I use it? First that's the first question. Um, well what I want to prove is inductively I want to prove an isomorphism. So let's say I want to look at the middle isomorphism, right? I, I'm looking at this middle isomorphism of the sphere between degree k and degree k plus one. That's the one that I want. Okay, let me restrict to that. You can actually show that if you have that in a strong enough way, then automatically you have uh, the the, the full hard So I want this map. All right, this I want this to be an isomorphism. I don't how I don't know how to construct or control a left shift map directly. I don't know what's, what a generic map should be. So I start with the map that I know. So for instance, the multiplication with some indeterminate. Okay. And then the next thing is, well, if this kernel, if the kernel is not zero of this, well, then I take a generic linear combination with another determinant. Right, ideally, then the kernel of this here is the intersection of the kernels, and then I can do this again with another vertex. Right, and this I can do until I have all the variables, and then there's a basic, it's a basic consequence of Poincare duality that if I have all the, if I multiply with everything in degree one, um, then and the kernel and look at the intersection of the kernels, then it is zero. So, what I want is to prove inductively the following property. So I call, I call this uh, the, the, the transversal prime property. So if I have a set W of the vertices of my sphere, then what I want is that the, 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 the generic, the kernel of the generic linear combination, this is somehow signified by the quotation marks, is equal to the intersection of the kernels. Okay? So if this is the notes that I that, that's, that I have below this, um, is, is exactly what I just explained. Um, let me give you one more intuition why this is the right thing, why this is a good thing to do. Why, why is this related to the whole Amman relations at all? So let me explain this. 
So I want to prove, right, inductively, I have constructed some generic linear combination on some vertex at W prime, and then, then I have a new vertex x d. Right? And I want to take, so this is W, 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 and then I want to add generic linear combination of that. So this is my B, and this is my A. Okay? Then what I want is that I want to look at X, X, V. All right, and I want to look at X, V applied to the kernel of A. So this is kind of the pullback to, the, to, this, to this prime divisor. And I want to intersect this with the image of A. Okay, but pullback is again a Poincare duality algebra. And then what I'm saying is, okay, so not naturally the, uh, the kernel and the image they stand on top of each other in the Poincare pairing. So I pull them back to the same dimension. Now they both live in the, in, in, in the idea of XV, right? So the intersection can only happen in this idea. And now what I'm say, am I saying? Well, I'm saying that two orthogonal complements do not intersect but in zero. But I mean, this is kind of, okay, so one basically the algebra effect tells you that Orthogonal complements in the Poincare duality algebra, they don't intersect precisely if the pairing does not degenerate on them. And that's exactly the whole Armand relation, right? So what I said is I look at this algebra by linear form and I want to be I want to be non-trivial at interesting subspaces, right? I want to be I want to, I want it not to degenerate at interesting subspaces. So that's that's uh, the that's a relation. Let me I mean, let me go over the namesakes for 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 um, two for 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 a minute or two because they gave the inspiration of how to get there. So I mean, Paul, you might know, all right? Paul marriage theorem basically says that um, if you have two sets of the same size and you have some expanding relation between them, then you can then this relation is the support of a perfect matching. And now, if you think about it, then the property that's having of having some of this um, this whole amount relations of having some of this correct form not degenerate on the degree it corresponds to with a little bit of uh, some imagination it corresponds to this this uh, this expanding relation property. And in fact, one of the proofs there are many proofs of Paul marriage they are, works exactly by basically greedily in first order. Matching, uh, matching people with the, matching couples with each other. Of course, in this case, I mean, so what I'm doing is really just the first, first order approximation. In this combinatorial world, you have to be a little, you have to be a little more clever. Um, but uh, on the other hand, in other places, in other places, it's got some of this is much easier, right? The other thing is a fear from engineering. So it's a kind of um, this is the other main set where Tom on it. It deserves explanation because it's actually a theorem in algebraic geometry that engineers were interested in. So it's, you, you might know that in architecture, it's kind of uh, beneficial if your building is somewhat stable. Um, so for instance, if you have your building built out of sticks um, that are glued together, then it should be in some way rigid, like in, at least infinitesimally rigid. So you shouldn't be able to deform it, or in other words, any any deformation um, of of the of 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 the of the building that keeps some of the sticks intact should come from a global isometry. And you can work a little and with these intersection rings and show that first of all, so this is there's this famous criterion for 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 the progressively rigid. This is this uh, Laman criterion. And then what you can what you can show is that it's exactly equivalent to one of these non-expanding relations. All right, so sorry for to one of these expanding relations. That's uh, ah, you cannot actually see the pointer. This is the first there is of information, and this is finally the left shift at the moment. So um, there is a way. So well, this is somehow it's kind of there's a cool really small, but uh, not really somehow really properly formulated or somehow at least not for mathematicians um, uh, a theorem that uh, that tells us that uh, 
um, that that you can construct left sheds uh, theorems, uh, left sheds isomorphisms under certain expanding rules. Um, now this explains how I get from the whole amount relations. In, 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 in co dimension one, in lower dimensions, right? So now, all the one relations in the pullback, I get to the hard left sets. And then there's also a way to, um, to, to, to go from, um, to go from, and so I mean, to complete the induction, I have to tell you how to conclude all the one relations from lower dimensional left sets. Um, and this is the following it's a little more complicated. Um, and it involves it mixes some in, in an interesting way this kind of these intersection rings with some with some basic geometric topology of spheres. Um, I, I stated the simplest case here. So it basically says, let's look at the Hollerman relations um, inside our sphere. Um, and let's let me restrict the subcomplex a little. So let me restrict the ideal I look at it. And let me say that it comes from a co dimension one manifold, and that this co dimension one manifold, this hypersurface, uh, is in fact a sphere again. And then basically, so the, 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 the statement is that you have the whole Laman relations, again, the pointer is not, I mean, sorry, force of habit. The whole Laman relations at this ideal, if and only if a certain primitive space vanishes. And then you have to realize that this primitive space vanishing. Is exactly is exactly the same as the left shift theorem. So um, we have this now. Uh, we have this uh, uh, example here. And actually, I think I deleted this foolishly, but uh, I, I let me go back to the case of P one plus P one. All right. So if I look at this uh, this quarter dimension one sphere, I can actually make it in color. Let me let me do that. So this is the quarter dimension one sphere. Green on yeah, green on top of the white white decision. Um, right, that's my co-dimension one sphere. Right, this is a one-dimensional zero-dimensional sphere. Um, and then the ideal is exactly that of generated by this vertex here and this vertex here. And the statement is really that um, these well, these these are. Uh, the 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 uh, this ideal does not satisfy this bias bearing property, if and only if um, well I mean in this case does not satisfy it because these lie on the line because it, somehow this this signifies if you think about it that the left shift theorem that the that somehow the, the, the geometry that you give to it by the continuous reduction does not satisfy the left shift theorem, and so it's not quite general enough to just analyze hypersurface spheres but somehow. In this dimension, if I look at the 2k minus 1 sphere and look at a subcomplex, then I can always embed myself. If, if, I, come on, if I look at a, a subcomplex of uh, sufficiently low dimension, in this case k minus 1, then I can always embed into the boundary of a regular neighborhood. So it's actually enough to construct, to consider, to consider hypersurfaces for this, for this theorem, if you want, if to kind of characterize the bias pair property. But then you have to, I mean, then you have to be a little more clever about it. You, know, you have to actually construct a relation between the, the, the superficial homology on the one hand and this towering on the other. And this is this isomorphism below. And this gets a little bit technical. If you want, at some point I can explain it. But uh, I think somehow, let me leave it at that for the moment. All right. Um, let me end the talk. Um, and uh, so let me let me just outline some of the the things that come out we've been doing so with this with this technique um, and which uh, somehow which have some some interesting applications to various things so somehow this this idea of constructing left shed elements iteratively in a general position setting is actually quite useful so let me mention one thing that is joint work with uh, um, with uh, David Kastan and Tommy Ziegler. And this is the, the Schmidt ring is essentially proportional. So it's linearly bounded, it's really linear correlated between two bounds. It's linear depending on, depending on the constant on above and co constant below um, to Gauss Wolf analytic rank. Uh, another way of saying it, you know, if you don't know this Gauss Wolf analytic rank, is 
um, that if you take um, a space of multilinear forms, um, such that every element in the space has a, a small Schmidt, Schmidt rank, so you can factorize it into a, a small number of, 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 of lower degree forms, then the entire space in a certain way has a factorization. Um, and then there's some progress that we managed, although only partially, towards a single conjecture. And at least somehow we managed to, 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 um, to reformulate single conjecture in terms of the lecture property um, in some interesting cases. And in some interesting cases, we, uh, we proved it. But somehow, for, for now, there's small. There are small. This is kind of a little piecemeal, so it's not totally a success, but somehow there's, there's some progress at least. And uh, somehow, also, so I explained something that somehow, I mean, this reconciling Davis O'Connor and Leon Reiner with Peru is, uh, is not really that they were enemies at some point. They just, I mean, they had two different approaches to this, to this problem. And so one of the, one of the corollaries is that somehow we have, somehow we kind of, we, we can, we can, we can explain how these approaches are related, which was something that was not really possible before. And then somehow there are some other two more things that somehow I'm looking at the moment, but uh, the more I go, the more, the more work in progress this is. So there's some uh, some work on 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 conjectures of Venkatesh, which was originally uh, uh, suggested by by David. Said so, uh, this this might be useful. Um, and uh, recently, my my wife Yasmin Mats has also gotten involved into this project. And then there's something even further uh, away that's come out important in model theory. Let me not go into this too much. Um, all right, uh, so I have a final slide. Um, so one, one interesting thing is that um, we managed to, to um, so one of the interesting aspects of this is that we managed to, to, to basically give a new way of, 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 of uh, understanding this, 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 this theory of, of, of combinatorial commutative algebra, this commutative algebra of these intersection rings for, for simplicial complexes and some other natural objects in a more small, in a more inter, I mean, so it used to be that somehow we when used some things from, 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 from commutative algebra that were very strong, but somehow that's uh, that made some, some geometric ideas, some geometric relations. For instance, is the fact that there's a relation between simplicial homology and um, and, and some other the, 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 the intersection ring in a, small, in a very small, in a very nice sense, made it very small. I mean, you can still do it, but somehow you, it was a little obfuscated. So one thing is somehow that's nice is that um, uh, that somehow there will be somehow that somehow we managed to, to, to give this somehow some interesting footing. In particular, you can relate it now to some ge geometric ideas. So you can give actually Gromov norms on these kind of places. It's very nice. Um, so there will be a book at some point. There was also kind of an appetizer that somehow gives like the basic theorems of this area in terms of this new way of uh, some of this new way of proving things and some of these new proofs for for classical theorems of Horsta and Reisner and uh, and so on. And if you don't like to read, uh, I mean, particularly I don't write very well. Um, you can also. Um, come to the Hadamard lectures at Yashef next year. Well, this is kind of hopefully. And with that, I close. And thanks. And all the best for Walter. All right. Um, are there any questions? I can't really tell. I mean, Kareem might be able to see better. No, I think I can only tell if someone switched the video on. Uh -huh. But I mean, this, I mean, you just uh, maybe speak. I don't know. Is that a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm actually curious about uh, the theorem that you mentioned, the direction you mentioned about um, cat zero aspherical manifolds and the Singer conjecture. Yeah. So, um, so firstly, a, is this method morally a variation on Gromov's ideas about um, Kähler hyperbolicity and the Singer conjecture? Because there you're directly implicating a Lefschetz theorem. Yeah, no, it's different. Like actually, I mean, um, I, I sat together with him uh, um, 
last summer and we discussed this and at, at first we, sh we we thought that, the, that there is a relation, but then uh, it's not thinking more and more we concluded that there's that it's really a different thing. So the answer is no. It's I mean this is really not Taylor thing. So it's really um, you you in the end you want to, to prove a left shed theorem, but it's of, of the type of a generic type of shed theorem. I mean there's there seems to be no no Kähler structure on, right. So the Kähler structure kind of this is kind of talking projective and um, it's it's not present in this case. It's not the same. Okay, that's the answer. I mean I can uh, we do it. I mean we can we can get more technical later too, but maybe not today, but tomorrow because it's late for me, but uh, tomorrow. Yeah. I think I, I'm happy to discuss. All right, more questions? Okay. okay. Uh, so there is a question I see on the chat. Yeah, I see a kind of half of it. Um, um, let me see. I can maybe I can. The, uh, yeah. If, ah. Yeah. yeah. So she, maybe I'll read the question since I don't know. Yeah, if yeah, everyone the else. information. That's right. Uh, yeah. That's right. Okay. So the answer is yes. Okay. Well then. <laughs> Okay. Are, are there any more questions? Okay. Um, if not, let's thank uh, Kareem again. Uh, you know, you could do it with thumbs up or uh, whatever other. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. 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 Thank you for having me.